All right. You ready? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Hi. This is more fight update number. Actually, I'm losing track now. Well, it's 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 May, so it should be five, right? Should be. Should be. At least we hope so. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. In the way in the way of update today or as of right now. Uh, a lot of things have changed. As you can see behind us, we've changed a little bit the uh, the setup of the place. We want to, you know, we're trying to make it look a little bit more professional. We're trying to, uh, yeah, just always trying to clean up our videos and add a little bit more, make things look a little better. Clean up our act. Um, yeah, clean up our <laughs> act. That's really what we're really what we're going for here. Anyways, yeah, we're doing that. Uh, Sam and Dan, like I've said in the past one, have they both have jobs now at Amazon, and they're working full time. Because of that, there there have been a few changes for the like for editing and things. We're deciding now. We're going to uh, one of the changes is we're going to actually fold the BTS stuff totally into the updates. We're going to have our update, and then at the end of this one, we're actually or the update's not going to take too terribly long. But we have a topic we want to discuss. Discuss. Mm -hmm. Discuss. Yeah. Um, we'll discuss. But then yes, we will discuss our, the rest of our content, the cartoon commentary, things of that nature. We are going to put those on Subscribestar for our uh, exclusive subscriber content. That way there is something here that's going on. We have updates. Plus, I, I will probably post, I'm, right now, I'm making a distiller. That's our current, mm -hmm. that's my current project. Uh, I am... A big one. Which, <laughs> yes, yes, so, uh, both, yeah, literally and figuratively. But either way, I'm making that video right now. Stuff like that, projects of that nature that are practical, I will be posting as well to our YouTube channel. Um, we're looking at even more changes than that in the future for things. We're going to be painting here still in the background. There's going to be other things we're going to be doing to change it up. And it's going to, it's just hopefully it's going to keep getting better and better, our quality of uh, our videos. The the Sonavox video, or the Sonavox, I am taking, a, not, not taking a break on, but we discussed it. And we decided right now is probably not the optimal time this summer, especially in light of events of the coronavirus and all that, to go ahead with our Kickstarter. We have seen a lot of Kickstarters that have, I, I don't know about right now, but in the past or recent past, we've seen a lot that were for some, some of them were for terrible products, honestly, <laughs> and they still got mostly funded. So that, yeah. it, it gives us some hope, you know, but yeah. at the same time, we would rather make everything really, really good and solid Do first. Right. Yeah. We've been discussing some, some radical new ideas actually for making the Son of Ox. That's, yeah. uh, since we have a little bit more time in that, in that sense, um, I'm, well, one, I'm taking a break to do the distiller thing, but on top of that, we're talking about some radical, fundamental, not changes, but I would say additions to it. Right, yeah, the stuff we've talked about is things that we don't want to give too much away because it may not pan out, um, but if it does, it would change the nature of the product a little bit, and it would also have different options. It would be possibly different tiers or different uh, levels of I don't want to say quality, but different levels of options available if someone wanted to get basically like a cheaper version versus the more expanded version that had everything involved. We'll go into all that as we uh, discuss that more as we figure it out and as we kind of plan it and see how it's going to work together. Exactly. So that's uh, it's exciting because there's a lot more we're, we're thinking we can do on it and develop since we're taking a little more time to do that. But um, that means that we won't see that product done, um, at least when we plan to possibly by the end of the year, but again, anything could happen apparently in 2020. So, so uh, yeah, that's where we're at with that. As, as Mark said, uh, I've been working, Dan's been working full time. Uh, you know, we got to pay the bills and everything somehow. So uh, we've been doing that. Our painting business pretty much dried up once the uh, coronavirus kicked in and everyone stayed home and nobody wanted, was inviting us over to paint their house anymore. So uh, it's, uh, so that's probably the reason why we went and did that. But because of that, you know, that only leaves so much time and energy to do other projects. We've had to kind of dial things back. Uh, I did want to update a little bit on stuff. We're still working on things, but it's just some stuff we're going to have to take a little longer on. The animation stuff that I was working on with using AI is uh, the initial stuff I had started to do was a little bit promising. But then as I started investigating, I was realizing a lot of that landscape is changing every day. There's new programs, there's new ways of iterations, all that kind of stuff. So. Right now, I took a step back from it because I didn't want to get too involved in something only to find out, hey, there's actually a way that's faster, 10 times easier to do it that was just released, you know, last week because that's how those things are developing. So uh, if you want to keep up with any of that, uh, we'll probably talk about that a little more in the future. Uh, but I mean, it was just the other day I was posting something showing how there was another version of one of those type of programs for doing uh, AI, uh, whether it's face replacement or any of that kind of stuff. and. 
Uh, it's, it's really promising because there's a lot of different stuff there, but I think a lot of it has, is just it's kind of the Wild West where a lot of it hasn't been explored or hasn't been developed yet. And so we're going to be, um, I'm going to be looking into that to see like what the possibilities are and something that, that could be stable that we could use for that kind of thing, at least for the way we've envisioned it. Uh, the other project that I ha am working on but is taking a little longer than I had anticipated is the uh, Hidden History uh, mm -hmm. podcast. What I've decided to go with on that due to time constraints is just go ahead and make it as an audio, a mainly audio a podcast, uh, as opposed to making it a full-blown video. I was hoping to do it a little more production value, make it more like a video series. Um, I will be doing the narration and, and putting together all the editing, the script, and all that, and the research, but I'm going to do it more as an audio-based thing. I will make video versions of it to put on YouTube, but it'll probably be a little more basic as far as the video goes. It will be, uh, you know, some stock footage, that kind of stuff. But um, as far as that goes, I am excited about it. It's the content and the uh, the things I've been reading about and getting into are very interesting, and, and I'm just trying to make sure I, I do everything justice and it all makes sense. But it also uh, is not going to be exactly what I envisioned. But that's how these things go, you know, when you're developing stuff. So, yeah, yeah, I, I myself can't wait. I believe we've had some very interesting discussions already about it, um, and. Oh, along those lines, I also wanted to apologize to our subscribers and people like of and of that nature. We uh, we have dropped the ball a little bit on the subscriber content thing, which is why we're making so many changes now. Because we're still trying to we're still dialing this whole thing in. We're still mm -hmm. trying to get it. Because we're we're not we we're not aiming to be content providers. So in that way, we kind of have to walk this line of how much do we need to try and cater to uh, regular videos being put out and whatnot as opposed to, uh, well, and, and for subscriber-exclusive mm -hmm. content, because we, we do want to give our subscribers something, you know, at least, something unique. Well, and, and a lot of that is because it's, when you're making stuff online, it's a juggling act between the message or the product or the content that you want to create, yes. what people who are watching your stuff want to see, fans, reactions, etc., or even criticism, and feeding the algorithm. And all of those things may at yeah. times be pulling in different directions. And so you have to try to decide, is it more important to just stick with what we want to make, whether people like it or not, and whether the algorithm likes it or not, or do we want to try to play up some stuff that is going to feed the algorithm, is going to do well, but it's going to be clickbait. I mean, you know, there's yeah. all this kind of stuff that we've had many discussions of trying to decide where we're going to fit in as far as that goes, because we always want to have, we always want to be honest, we want to have integrity with what we make, we want to stand behind what we make, but to make it, to have a presence at all online, to do a Kickstarter, all that kind of stuff, you have to, like I said, feed the algorithm basically, do things that are going to bring people to you or bring you up to people. And uh, to do that, you have to kind of play by YouTube or whoever, their rules that they've set in place, the way the algorithms favor things and all of that. So we're, we're, tr we're still, again, trying to find our place within all of that. We, we know what we want to do. We're just trying to make sure we do it the right way and present everything in the right way. Um, and of course, all of that on a budget of almost nothing. So, <laughs> so yeah, if you do yeah. want to see us uh, step it up a little bit, you can always donate to our subscribe star. Uh, if you go to subscribe star, uh, we'll have the link in the subscription and in the description below. And through that, you can either do monthly or a one-time thing. If you just want to throw us a few bucks, or if you want to say, "Hey, I want to sign up, give these guys, you know, five bucks a month or whatever," anything uh, you can do, we we definitely love it, and it, we can guarantee it will be put directly towards buying equipment, buying oh, yes. software, all that stuff to make sure our stuff is better um, and is what we, in, is fulfills that vision that we have for what we want to make and what we want to bring into the world, so. Exactly. Yeah, uh, with that, I want to go ahead and launch into the topic, unless there's something else. I, yeah, that sounds good. Okay, I want to go ahead and launch into our topic then. Uh, we, we decided we wanted to, um, <laughs> I'm going to take a, take a page out of, well, uh, the, the Petty Profits podcast, but also a few other podcasts, numerous other podcasts before that, and talk about just one topic, one subject, and we're not just, uh, you know, it's not just small talk about whatever, not open format quite. We're, we want to talk about one subject that's relevant. And the reason uh, I, well, I, I kind of presented this subject to Sam as an idea before, because it comes up a lot. I, um, there was... Specifically in this instance, on, on, on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook a ton, but I have to be necessarily somewhat for our, our business. I have to post, you know, videos and things of that nature. Um, I did see, however, there are a few friends. You know, over time you accrue quite a few Facebook friends. 
And there are some that you agree with and some that you don't, and some that you talk to all the time, some that you don't, you know, it just depends. Some you may mute their, their <laughs> updates and whatnot, it just depends. But there's always those first few you see whenever you get on the site, no matter what, that are on your feed. And one of the ones that I happened to see was a joke, it was a meme. And this meme, it starts out with, it, it's an old joke. It's a, it's a dad, and the dad's, uh, there's a dad and a son, and the son builds, a, let's say, a tower. Let's say it's out of Legos, builds a Lego tower. The dad, then, once he sees that, he says, oh, good job, son, and he takes half the tower. And the son starts crying and everything, and the dad says, that's socialism, son, don't let them bring it here. However, in this meme, it went on, and the son says, no, I'll have to, I'll, I'll post the picture so everyone can see it, because um, I'm probably going to butcher it, but the son says, no, that's not your, you stole my labor, that's not, that's capitalism you're thinking of, and I forget the rest of the response, there was a little bit more to it, but I've seen a lot of things of this nature, and it, it, it's, it's rather, at first it was a little concerning, but then I realized why am I, like, I, I started to question why I was concerned about this, or, and I, I started to question why, what, what my real knowledge on capitalism versus socialism versus communism really is. We just had a presidential candidate, Bernie Sanders, who ran for president, and he is a very obvious socialist. Mm -hmm. He said it himself. He does not ever deny it. It's very, very obvious. And he gained a lot of support. He garnered quite a lot of support. And there's a lot of support for the socialist uh, ideals, that whole movement, right now, it seems like. And part of that, I believe is to do with young people. I see a lot, a lot of young people, uh, once again, younger generations, on Facebook, on other places, Twitter once in a while, and they're posting stuff that's in favor of socialism. Mm -hmm. Now, I've always been taught growing up that, you know, socialism, communism, bad, mostly communism. You hear communism is it, it, synonymous with bad. Mm -hmm. And people tried to tell me that growing up, and I, I've seen movies and things, but why is that? It's, it's good to ask these fundamental questions, mm -hmm. what, you know, starting from the, from the very beginning on socialism, uh, what is socialism? Mm. And uh, with that, we started looking into it a bit, and that's the, that's the topic we want to discuss. Now, I am going to read off the definition of socialism as defined by history, the, the, or the History Channel, sorry, not history, <laughs> the History Channel, uh, which some people may agree or may not agree with, but... More on my sources in just a minute. The History Channel says, and this was online, you can look it up, uh, they said socialism describes any political or economic theory that says the community, rather than individuals, should own and manage property and natural resources. The term socialism has been applied to very different economic and political systems throughout history, including utopianism, anarchism, Soviet communism, and social democracy. These systems vary widely in structure, but they share an opposition to an unrestricted market economy and the belief that the public ownership of the means of production and making money will lead to better distrib distribution of wealth and a more egalitarian society, uh, end quote. The, the goal is more or less to even the playing field, so to speak, or diminish that gap between the rich and the poor. Now, that is as succinct and whole of a definition as, uh, as, as I think I found mm -hmm. anywhere. Yeah. Basically, when I, when, for me personally, when I was looking this up, you are going to find people who have different definitions of socialism or <laughs> yeah. of communism or of all these things. Mm -hmm. So to try and get a better frame of reference, I just, uh, I, and I, people say Google's slanted. So to avoid that even, I went with DuckDuckGo. Mm -hmm. And I took the first entire page of DuckDuckGo search uh, hits, results, and I went through all of those. I went, to, went through the History Channel, Merriam-Webster, dictionary definitions, and, and then I, I didn't just Google socialism, or I didn't just search for socialism, I searched for communism. I searched for the difference between socialism and communism. I searched for the difference between socialism, communism, and capitalism. I searched everything in between. So I have a, I, I went down through a ton of sites, and just to let you know too, this is just a cursory, just very, uh, I'm, I'm going to edit this video down to less than an hour because we could be in here for the rest of the night and tomorrow and probably, the, uh, there's an entire course you could probably teach on this. Oh yeah, for sure. But anyways, I started looking all that up and let me see here, that's pretty much the brief introduction to it. Now, as far as in, um, in popular culture, 
it has been seen mostly in things like dystopian future uh, books, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Orwell, mm -hmm. Orwell's Animal Farm came out in 1945. Mm -hmm. I have read that book, and then I have also read or heard the uh, the book on tape at least, or on I say on tape. I'm so <laughs> old. <laughs> on YouTube, an audiobook. My bad. Right after I listened to my record player, I put on the tape, <laughs> and then uh, let me see here. Of 1984, yeah, which actually came out in 1949, yeah, and Animal Farm was 1945. There's another guy uh, named Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Mm -hmm. He, in 1973, released a book that was written, uh, I believe, the de the decade prior or so, and it's called Gulag Archipelago. It is directly relating to. I mean, the others are about dystopian futures, mm -hmm. but Gulag Archipelago directly relates to the Soviet Union, the rise, the what it was like in the Soviet Union directly. He was there, he was uh, oppressed under their, that regime, mm -hmm. and then the fall and w what all happened afterwards, everything. He just goes into it all. But this is also not a new idea either. Mm -hmm. uh, way, 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 way back in it's about 360 BC, Plato mm -hmm. wrote Republic. And in his Republic, he presents an idea of a communal society mm -hmm. like that. That's, um, it's funny because we were talking, there's some overlap there because I've been researching some of, I've been reading some of Plato's writings to do with the Atlantis episode I'm working on oh, for yeah, the yeah. history. And he begins one of the, uh, I can't remember which one of the writings that contains the Atlantis information, but he mentions that they had been talking in the previous conversation well, I say conversation, there's debate whether these were real conversations or if he just made them up and wrote them down. But regardless, he, he talks about a previous conversation where they were discussing the perfect society, the perfect world, and, and you know, if they just philosophized everything out to the nth degree, what would be the best thing? And it was interesting because they came to a similar uh, setup as a socialist society where basically there was a, uh, whether it was a, I can't remember if it was a group or a, or a specific person, I believe it was a council of some sort at the top would decide what should go where. So who should be a farmer, who should be a mechanic, who should be whatever. And then they would need to, from, you know, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, without saying those words, he described that exactly. And that children wouldn't be raised by their specific actual physical parents. They would be raised by the entire uh, community. So that whole it takes a village concept came from there. Uh, so all of this basically to say this isn't new uh, thought. This isn't a new concept. Karl Marx didn't come up with the idea for socialism and communism, although he distilled those ideas very much. Uh, this is stuff that people have been uh, philosophizing about for a long time. Quite right. In my searches, I did find, let me see here, what was next? The Nazi Party, oddly enough, the, Na the National Socialist Party, mm -hmm. which came from the German Workers' Party, that was mm -hmm. the predecessor to that, very socialist. The German Workers' Party was incredibly socialist. The Nazi Party took that and then corrupted it. They added some weird ideals. Hitler himself added things, added to it and the whole supreme race, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. I can't remember the German word for that. Mm -hmm. But Uber there's... That, yes, yes, mm -hmm. all that. They're... Well, he was... They spread it to that, and that's... Well, the, anyways, they, they changed it. Yeah, yeah. Because it was basically the whole socialist idea combined with the nationalism, and all of that wrapped up in that idea of the Uberman, the ideas proposed by Nietzsche. He was very big into Nietzsche's ideas, which we were talking the other day, were in some ways against or... or, or aren't are directly opposed to Marx's ideas, but in some ways actually are the same thing in some of those concepts. And that is one of them is that uh, there should be, there is one supreme, well, that's one that he latched onto that Hitler did, obviously, that there's one, there's a supreme race that should you know, reign over everyone else. And that's where we get the, the whole Aryan race idea and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but all of that fit into that concept of socialism very well in order to give him the power he needed to make his idea a reality. Before we go any further, too, to clarify a little bit further, uh, so socialism and communism. I had to look extensively to find this, because once again, a lot of people define socialism differently, and communism even people define differently. However, one thing that a lot of people, that most of them agree upon, one of the tenets of it all, is that socialism is pretty much the... The means of production, the factories, all that, is owned by the worker, controlled 
by the workers. Some state owned, mm -hmm. same state controlled, mm -hmm. but essentially it's state owned by the the state, and the state owns all that, and the workers control it more or less, mm -hmm. quote unquote. I that's once again that definition's a little bit murky, but the biggest difference between that and communism is that in communism there is no state. Ideally, and I didn't know this before, but socialism eventually is supposed to, in an ideal society, dissolve into communism. Communism is the utopian end result, supposedly, of socialism. Mm -hmm. Because in communism, everything's owned by the workers, the workers run everything, they get all the profits and share all the profits, distribute everything communally as they, as they see fit. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's essentially that's essentially the difference, and that's what it boils down to with the uh, well. And in the name itself of socialism, it has the idea of social ownership, social socially run society uh, versus individual. So that's a key point to remember: is that whether those ideas sound good or bad to you, that is the key difference with socialism and communism, and anything further down the line in that yes. route is that you're taking away, whether it's independence or liberty or, um, like you said, the means of production or whatever it is, freedom essentially, or choice, freedom of choice from the individual and giving it to the society, giving it to the community the as a whole. You're giving it from the, from the individual to the group. And that is seen as being inherently good or being an inherent positive. Now, if that bothers you on some level or if you feel that that is a inherent negative thing, then you, whether you understand it or not, you are not someone who agrees with socialism or communism. Uh, if you think that the individual should have supreme liberty and independence and freedom in their own choice and how they live their lives, then that yeah. would not jive with socialism or communism at any point. Like the whole, the whole thesis behind it is that the individual is only important so much as they matter to the group, to uh, society as a whole. Um, and so here in the West, that obviously is, goes against many of our fundamental uh, concepts of liberty, freedom, independence, individuality, all that kind of stuff. Well, and, and to, to add to some of the confusion, just in case you weren't confused enough already, <laughs> socialism, as I said, uh, there were other things under that banner, like anarchism and other, other mm -hmm. movements mm -hmm. and other visions of society and ideas of how to run things. Before 1917 was more or less the time when all that was associated, like things like anarchy were associated with it. Because they shared that they all shared that idea of wanting the of the the, the, the workers should control everything and there there shouldn't be such a big gap between the, there shouldn't be such a disparity of wealth between the the classes mm -hmm. and the Russian Revolution occurred and then after nineteen seventeen there uh, Marxism became essentially the most popular form of socialism because Karl Marx had written his stuff and it, it, even posthumously I think whatever it became more popular mm -hmm. but once it did and it caught on that became the predominant thing that people referred to as socialism so then the other ones all split off and formed like went their own ways essentially and so that once again added some of the, con the confusion mm -hmm. and then uh, it, it further like you were saying it further distilled with each person Vladimir Lenin's ideas uh, and his take on some of this eventually inspired a consolidation of power which ended up being the foundation of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin in the 1920s. And uh, I think it's widely, widely agreed upon that that was a terrible, terrible thing, terrible time for yeah. the people in the USSR. Everything collapsed in the 80s, and then followed by the... U like There were other countries that were trying to follow socialist agendas mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. and it collapsed in the 80s. The USSR actually collapsed, or it actually fell on December 25th, 1991. I didn't realize it was that late. Mm -hmm. I was born in 86, so I was only uh, five years old. But regardless, I was shocked that I, that, that, that was going on when I was, mm -hmm. you know, five years old. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah, that was only 30 years ago, less than 30 years ago. In addition to that, let me see here, uh, I started looking up more recent examples. And, of course, you can point to China, you can point to Russia, because those are more, uh, more current examples of totalitarianism more. It's, mm -hmm. it's you know, it's similar. And their ideas, they, they claim some of the same things. But more to the point, uh, South America. Mm, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to go with Venezuela here. Because Venezuela, it, it's not completely communist or socialist. But it's a sort of a populist government with communist and socialist concepts in 
state capitalism, what they call state capital capitalism. State capitalism. Yes, the state owns national resources uh, like oil, iron, gas, power, communications. Okay. I had to write all this down because these definitions just get me every time. Mm -hmm. But private property with restrictions. Government controls the exchange rate and concern, uh, the currency, government finance, leading to massive inflation. That's what happened pretty much. Mm -hmm. There were a few guys who had lived there, actually. Uh, between 2007 and 2017 was the regime of Hugo Chavez. And Hugo Chavez, what happened was the people in Venezuela were in a horrible way from the previous regime. There was a lot of poverty. They were just ready for change of some sort. Hugo Chavez came in, offered them socialism, and said, hey, everybody, I'm going to expand healthcare. I'm going to expand everything, education. I'm going to take us from poverty and lift us all up. And at the time, it just so happened, business economy, which was actually capitalistic in nature, their economy was capitalistic, and they were using all the proceeds from that because they're, they had a bunch of oil gains going on right then. Mm -hmm. They had incredible gains from oil because, it, it, like I said, the industry was booming at the time, and they were making a lot of money. So all that capital they were earning, they were propping up their socialist, they were using it to prop up their socialist uh, system to, mm -hmm. to start one. Mm -hmm. And essentially that's what's happened in Venezuela is they started spending massively on education, on things like, oh, yeah, welfare, etc. And then after they spent a whole bunch on this, years and years later down the road, they ran into some problems and it proved unsustainable. But that's essentially what's going to happen anyways. Mm -hmm. If there's any kind of a, an earthquake or, you know, some kind of, if anything happens that's really big and tumultuous for the nation, it's going to throw everybody into chaos and turmoil because people will suddenly turn and they, they the, the people in Venezuela decided they didn't want socialism. They decided, oh, it didn't work because we're having problems now. Mm -hmm. So we don't want socialism anymore. They were never really 100% for it anyways. So it kind of... You could say that may have been one. Of the, some people argue that's the reason it didn't really work. Hmm. The argument against that would be that this was only one country in yeah. South America. Yeah. In the early 2000s, if you look it up, there was what is called a pink wave of socialism, where many, many countries in South America tried to uh, tried to take up socialism. They tried to instill institute socialism in their country in one form or another, and they all failed. Let me see here. What's uh, miserably? What's his name? In Ecuador, we used to live in Ecuador, mm -hmm. and then it, it was already a poor country, so it was a similar story with that. But there's a guy named Rafael Correa, who did the exact same thing. He came in and spent a bunch of money, mm -hmm. and then as soon as all the money starts to run out, and this is this this model's not sustainable, or so it seems with larger nations, then things happen. The things just fall apart. When we were talking about how this example or this uh, this pattern we see with socialism or communism plays out pretty much the exact same way every time. Someone comes in who seems to be, uh, the, the country's in a dire situation, whether economically, politically, whatever, things people are, there's unrest, people are not happy with the state of the world in their country. And someone comes in who seems to have the answer for everything. They seem to uh, have, be the revolutionary that we were looking for that kind of encaptures everything we wanted, whether it was Hitler, whether it was uh, someone like Lenin, whether it was Mao, whoever it is, there always is a fairly large positive rush towards them because, okay, this is going to solve all the problems. This, this guy's got the answer. Or this group of people have the answer. And then inevitably, as soon as they give over the reins of power, uh, whether through consent or, or just not dissenting uh, to these people, then the, they set themselves up as dictator for life. It's what always happens, every time. You look at Castro, everyone loved him. He was going to save the people. He was going to be great. Uh, his buddy, um, was, it Ch uh, was it Che? Um, Guevara. Guevara, yeah. They, they were all going to just, you know, it was going to be wonderful. They were for the people, by the people, etc. As soon as they got into power, they sat in that throne and they just kept it. And this is how this story always plays out. We were talking about yeah. this, how you can't find an example of socialism where this has not happened. Like, this is just, that's just how it goes. Now, you could argue, well, some countries are socialist to a degree, and therefore that is socialism and see it works. But the concept of socialism itself, if you 100% go with it, always ends that way. And part of the problem with that is because it doesn't factor in the, uh, the nature of humanity, that the selfishness, the pride, the sinfulness, really, of humanity and how... Uh, no one is going to 
follow through with yeah. the end result or the end goal of socialism. Yeah, that 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 kind of uh, my statement before kind of wrapped up all the history I was going to go into about it. But it, in addition, just in practice, there's some general points that you can cut, like some uh, logical points that you can come to. Mm. Just thinking about it, like you're saying, in practice, no private ownership. Just think about that concept for just a moment. No private ownership means that, let's see here, if we started a painting business, that would be owned. I, I don't even know if we'd be allowed to start one. I was going to say, you'd have to get approved to even start a business. It'd have to be in demand or something that the state decided that you could do. Mm -hmm. But let's just say they allowed you to and you were let, you were able to. That is then owned by the, well, the, either the workers or the state or whoever you want to say, but it's not you. Right. It's not owned by you. Right. Therefore, all the profits, everything, gets split up by the state. Mm -hmm. They decide what happens to it. And then, once again, the, 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 the concept of to each according to his need comes out, and they give you however much you need. Mm -hmm. But logically, once again, who's going to decide what you need? Right. Because everyone's needs are going to be different, mm -hmm. which means you would have to put a caseworker on everybody. Right. Or a caseworker for millions of people, whatever. Or just generalize everything. Like, yeah. Okay, you've got three kids. This is how much money you should get, regardless of where you live, how much cost of living is, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's yeah. People are not like a, ants or something. In They're a practical different. sense, it's kind of insane to if you let's say everything was rosy and you could implement it with you know with a bloodless revolution, et cetera. The system itself would be untenable. You could not maintain that kind of uh, micromanagement of individual lives in service of the collective for very long before it would either become a heavy totalitarian dictatorship or it would fall apart due to uh, just not being able to be run properly. There would be all kinds of issues, logistics issues that would pop up everywhere. Uh, it, it would not, it's not a, um, it's not a, a sense, of, a, uh, a system that makes sense. It's not a system that, um, could pan out long term. Um, yeah. Again, a big part of it's because it just completely ignores human nature or, or idealizes what humans would do or are capable of. And we've seen time and time again the examples of how it does play out. Well, and as you just alluded to, uh, as you just alluded to as well, it's if you think about socialism being implemented here in the U.S. and to you know that definition of socialism, if you're looking at actually uh, with a with an eye towards communism or not, either way, mm -hmm. people right now don't obey our laws. Right. Right. So, essentially, what what you alluded to is that there would have to be some measure of force mm -hmm. to implement socialism. Mm -hmm. So it, you'd it, have to yeah you'd have to beat down a bunch of people who don't want it. Right. right. Well, and that's the thing is, as a concept or as a system, it would require 100% compliance to work. Yeah. If you had 50% of the people did the, did the jobs they were told to do and 50% didn't, the system would fail. If you had even you know 75% of everyone listened and 25% of them formed a rebellion, the system would fall apart. It's not a... Like in the U.S., for example, where we have the freedom to be Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, whatever you want to do... Uh, just because you are that doesn't mean that the person next to you has, you know, their life completely changed or ruined or what have you. Uh, whereas if you're living in a, in a total socialist society or a communist society, you have to do the party line. You have to be part of that system. You don't have a choice to be otherwise. Other, otherwise, the thing doesn't work, which means you're and you're uh, you have erratic behavior from you know what you have been you're supposed to be doing. Therefore, you're going to get killed or removed or retrained or whatever you want to call it. Um, it, it requires a heavy hand of enforcement in order for it to even exist in the first place. Right. Another point that I was uh, that I wrote down because a lot of these are just like I said logical points, but capitalism can lead to unemployment during times of economic crisis or recession, mm -hmm. and a socialist state would employ people always. Uh, some models allow for individual ownership, but with high taxes and governmental controls, we see that around like in Canada and places, but that's. That's important to note as well, because uh, in a socialist state, I was reading about it, and there there have been examples in the past that during a during a war time or during a whatever, they'll just tell everyone to do, what like a uh, uh, not only will they keep everyone employed, but you're not going to get employed with whatever you want to do. It's whatever they delegate for you to do, mm -hmm. and if it happens to be during a war time or something, you're basically in Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. because that's right. exactly what the, the the German people. 
ten percent of the German people were Nazis, mm -hmm. y'all. Ten percent. Yeah. That's it. It was not. It was not a great, but massive majority of them. A lot of them were not true Nazis, or they didn't want to support Nazism. Right. right. But being in that state and being controlled by the Nazis, they were essentially just told, "You're going to do this. Hey, you're a baker. Well, guess what? Now you're baking bread for the army. Mm -hmm. Hey, you're making pocket watches. Guess what? Now you're making parts for a tank or something. You know, and it just had to do with their war effort mm -hmm. and their war machine to keep it going to take over the world, and yeah, to get rid of all foreigners and Jews and whatnot. There's I'm not even going to go into all that. Yeah. Another thing, too, I just was talk, <laughs> I just mentioned Canada. Uh, Americans hate taxes now. Yeah. If you were allowed to have an individual ownership of something, they would definitely tax you pretty high. Or there would be some, it's some stringent uh, government requirements that could be put in place. And, I, I mean, it's very obviously happened in some other countries. But people, people are upset right now about stuff, about the way things are. If we try to get more strict and more stringent with more requirements and whatnot, people actually, I mean, Americans, although some of them may be lazy, they love their freedoms. Yeah. They're not going to give that up. Once again, leading back to that force. You have to have force to make it, to instill it, to make it happen. Well, that's like we were just talking uh, earlier today about in California, they have some very um, left-leaning socialist-type programs that they run over there. They, it's, and in order to do that, they have a high tax system. And for, as part of their state, and even people who are left leaning politically are leaving that state in droves because they can't stand it. They can't keep up with paying all the taxes, or they don't want to, because that's encroaching on their personal freedom. Having to pay so much out of pocket for all of these systems that they may like, but when you feel that pain yourself in your wallet, yeah, it's not so fun, so much fun anymore. It's not such a grand idea anymore. Well, and not even just the pain. Uh, honestly, to be pr to be blunt about it we wouldn't have nice stuff because <laughs> yeah. in a socialist state you're not going to build skyscrapers and things unless it's for a leader or somebody right that's the only way stuff like that is going to happen that's another built. whole thing as far as philosophy and and uh you know personal creativity and all of that we hadn't really talked about is that everything must be in service of the people which means the state yes. yeah so it has to be in demand somehow you couldn't just go have an art show you'd have to have it approved. It would have to be art that is about how good the system is for the people and for the state, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or you'd have to do it underground and it would, you know, it would be a raid and you'd get burned down or whatever. It would not be a, uh, a nice, friendly, creative outlet. You wouldn't have those kind of options. You couldn't just make a movie about what you wanted. You couldn't just write a book about what you wanted. Um, it would have to be in secret or hidden away because unless it's approved, unless it's pro the party, pro the state, etc. It's not going to happen. Now, all that being said, I know that that all sounds pretty negative towards socialism and everything. However, the idea and the, the motivations behind it are not entirely bad. It's not bad to want, you know, people to be equal or to, to help the, the, the poor people and those kinds of things. That's not bad. Well, um, I, I disagree a little bit. I think it is a it's a shift in values. It's a shift in value from there are moral rights and wrongs and that's what we need to deal with to uh, this question of equality and saying, okay, this having someone who's rich and having someone who's poor in the same system is wrong. And that's the kind of talk we hear from people like AOC or um, Bernie Sanders is basically that there should not be very rich people. That in and of itself is evil. There should only be, I yeah. guess, a medium rich people across the board, or be, I guess poor. Everyone should be poor. Something like that. And that's a different set of values than uh, like the Judeo-Christian um, values that we talk about that our, our country and our kind of most of the Western world is based around, which are concepts of good and evil and right and wrong. It's replacing some of these things with this concept of economic equality as that is right and wrong. That is, it will be right, it will be good when everyone is equal, when everyone gets paid the same wage, when everyone has the same amount of stuff. And that's, uh, I mean, it's to quote, what is that, The Incredibles, where he says, when everyone's super, no one will be. That's essentially the world that they, that they idealize, that they say that is good, that is utopia, is that no true. one sticks out more than anyone else, no one has more than anyone else in any, in any facet, because we're all equally, uh, did, equally poor or whatever it is, you know, e equally lacking. Huh. Well, that's a very good point. That's not where I was going with that, but that's, no, that, that is a very good point, though. We're talking about the good and bad. I was going to say that on a small level, I think it works, personally. I think on a small level, you can point to all sorts of examples of... Not necessarily socialism per se, but that communal, uh, 
communal living sort of that 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 whole idea that actually is how things have to work on a small level sometimes if you're in a major city let's say for example and there's a problem in your neighborhood or something and the, and the cops don't aren't, aren't going to come on time or something you may have to you know group up with your neighbors to help solve that problem or you may have to you know there, there may be other things you have to work with people to do um, there, there are a lot of collaborations people have on a neighborhood kind of a basis and in a small on the small scale I think that can work you can have small you know communes and things that that everyone can kind of exchange things and be okay and whatnot I think when it gets too big once again the inherent uh, sinfulness of man, man's mm -hmm. inherent selfishness and everything kind of keeps us from that, that ultimate goal mm -hmm. because no matter, uh, when you get so big, there's going to be somebody who's not de not that determined, not 100% in on it. And if right. not, if right. not, there's going to be some young kid, some baby that's born somewhere and that that's, kid's going to grow up. They're going to want to be lazy or they're going to want something is going to, they're going to have other ideas mm -hmm. and you're just never ever going to have 100% participation except on a very small level. Right. Well, and even that, kind of a system like let's say a commune in a you know you live like the Amish or someone like that where you live off separately, separately you still those people still have individual personal responsibility and decision making as to whether they want to participate or whether they want to leave or what have you uh, or, or to what extent how much they're going to work that day and how much they're going to contribute or if you know they're not feeling good they're sick and they don't want to contribute so much whatever it is they may uh, they may do what they wish whereas if you decide, well, our entire governmental system and therefore all of our society within this, the, the borders of this country are going to be socialist, it, you've got to play ball. Everyone has to. It's going to be mandated. It's going to be instated. You won't have a choice to do anything else. Mm -hmm. And that's my main, one of my biggest issues with it is just the, the matter of personal choice and freedom. Um, yeah. Because even God, when he, uh, when man fell into sin, gave man the choice to do that. That's something that God gave man from the very beginning was the choice to do right or wrong, the choice to screw yourself up and to mess up your life or to do the right thing and reap the consequences for that. That's something that is has been embedded in God's relationship with man all along, so that we weren't made automatons and robots that had to love God or had to serve him. And we were talking about this a little bit before too, of how these kind of systems that have to by very their very nature get involved in every facet of your life they basically become god in your life they become a god of your life they become overarching they become like we said earlier micromanaging they have to tell you everything you can do and can't do uh you have to use the communal toilet when yeah. it's available and you know all this kind of stuff it's stuff like some just, horrible hoa yeah <laughs> exactly exactly and you won't have a say in whether it's changed or not, unless the majority of everyone also agrees it gets changed or not. And that's only if that power to change it is actually left up to the people. Again, as we've seen time after time after time, the power is never handed back to the people. It is always, no matter what the rhetoric says, the power is always left in the hands of those few people who took it in the first place. Because it's not a man's nature to give up power. And uh, that's just kind of how, how this, that plays out. It's very true. Uh, as I was saying before too about the you know you won't have nice stuff, uh, part of the, part of that the other side of that coin or whatever is that people are also not going to have as much ambition. Right. I've worked in a factory as I'm sure many of you have before. Now think about you being a small cog in that machinery. Mm -hmm. That's socialism more or less, or that's communism, that's whatever, mm -hmm. because you are doing your part to make the giant machine go. Now that means that you are hoisting up somebody else's profits or whatever. I mean, I guess ultimately in socialism, it would be everyone's profits. Right, right. But you don't get to, like you said, you can't do art. You can't like just go off and do your own thing. You can't have ambition. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if you're suppressing that kind of ambition, you are taking people who are, say, let's say there's an Albert Einstein mm -hmm. and you're not giving him, like you're giving him only his free time to go do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he would have to not be a lazy person and he would have to truly, truly, truly believe in what he was imagining and thinking and trying to do that was apart from the, the system, the state-run mm -hmm. program. So it, when you squash that kind of ambition and that kind of entrepreneurship and whatnot, you're really doing yourself a disservice. You're going to be light years behind everybody else as far as technology, right. development. As a country, yeah. You won't advance past the Stone Age. I mean, right. it's just going to right. stay that way. Because why would anybody want to progress from that when... Right. Uh, th a lot of people are lazy, like I was saying, uh, that they're just going to want to stay in that system and do their little part, mm -hmm. live life, 
the state gives them what they want, and that's good enough for them. Right. And then the ones that, who are itching to go do something can't do it, and they right. can't make the, they can't make the next iPhone or the whatever because they either don't have the freedom or the opportunity. To they have to go make bullets yeah. or something. Who knows? Right. You know, right. it's just something like that. The um the thing with Marx that's interesting is how that phrase to do with the uh, means of production. Uh, I was telling Mark, it's one of those tells that is, if anyone uses that phrase at all, something to do with means of production, then I know that they're, whether they know it or not, they're following Marxism, they're following, because he's the one who, who uh, basically distilled that concept down. And it's interesting because the end result of the systems that he proposed, socialism leading into communism, is actually the exact opposite of what he states that their goal is. Because the goal is to give that little, because uh, he talks about it a lot as far as a worker in, let's say, a factory doesn't get to be, doesn't get to pour their soul into the product that's getting made. They're not, as an individual, being able to be part of that, uh, that production. They're just a cog in a machine, and therefore we should give them more power to be able to have more of a say in that process. But by doing that, you do that with everyone, well, suddenly you've just watered down. Uh, and if you've ever done anything by a committee, you know that no individual uh, ambition or no individual uh, voice or vision gets fulfilled, it's just basically a, a glut of everyone's thoughts, you know, pooled together, which if it's not aligned, you're just going to kind of get whatever kind of fits out of all of those things together. And so you're not actually going to see what you, or get what you want out of life, out of that product you're making or whatever, it's going to be, well, that in tandem with everyone else's baggage tied into it. And so you're basically right back where you started. You as an individual are not going to have a true say in your life, a true say in the things you make, the things you do, your creative outlet, output, that kind of thing. You're, you're just trading one master for another. You're trading someone you don't like or disregard because they're too, much, too bigger than you, they have too much money for, you're taking that power, instead of moving it down to your level, you're moving it down to your level, but then spreading it out among everyone. So you're basically just as little and just as unimportant, if not more so, than you were before. So on that sense, I can't even, it's hard for me to even put myself in the place of, well, could socialism be that bad? Because once you start breaking it down on all these different parameters, you're like, well, no, that's just as bad, if not worse, than it was before anyways. So that does not, that's not getting me what I want, which is to have more liberty, more freedom, more creativity, more, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And there may be people who think like that, who say, I would want to be part of a collective where I don't matter. I'm just one of a thousand just like me who are all working together for the glory of whatever the country is. And I mean, if, if that's how you think and that's what you want, then you have to understand that those things go directly against, like I mentioned earlier, the Judeo-Christian principles, the principles of freedom, liberty, et cetera, et cetera, that this country was founded on. It's just, it, those things cannot, uh, cannot fit together. They can't be part of the same system, at least not in 100%. Anyway. I read an example somewhere uh, someone had made of a logical, a logical example of a, a situational. And they said, what if there was an island and people were shipwrecked on it? And let's say they had even been from different ships, if you want, strangers. These strangers on an island, with no hope of rescue or anything, and you know very little means, would immediately start to try and do things for their survival. No, so they would begin to uh, gather. One of them would start to gather firewood and go make a fire. One of them, and especially if they're all working together, one of them would go get you know some coconuts or whatever, and one of them would. Eat. Eventually, they would all have their own little things they could do, and some of them would gang up a little bit, and some of them would want to stay apart, etc. But ultimately, they would start trading things. One, one of them would, would find like a herd of wild goats somewhere on the island, let's say, and he would herd those goats and have them all together and be like, hey guys, you know, I, I've got a bunch of meat for us. Or I've, or I've, got, I've got a bunch of meat and then I can trade, you know, one of those goats for some coconuts or whatever you want, what have you. Or somebody else knows how to make rope that nobody else knows how to make. So they make, they make a bunch of rope and then somebody else is like, hey, I have a bunch of these, you know, and they, can you make me some of that rope? I know it's going to take you a bunch of time, but I'll make you a meal here at the end because I'm already cooking something for myself, and then I'll, in essence, pay you for that. Well, that's that's just a natural form of capitalism right there. Mm -hmm. Any kind of trade, yeah. Naturally, and some of these people might not necessarily all get along. Mm -hmm. If they didn't, then yeah, there's going to be separation, and, this, and then there's definitely going to have to be some sort of a, a, a marketplace, a pseudo-marketplace that takes place, because otherwise these people aren't going to be able to trade and if they can't trade, there's just going to eventually probably be some kind of a war or something. 
It's just not, it, it's not conducive, but to a, to a good atmosphere. And if you want to live and if you want to thrive and all that mm -hmm. and survive, you mm -hmm. got to learn to work with people and whatnot. But people aren't just going to give you things for free in general. Right. No one's just going to give you anything. Mm -hmm. So you have to do something or you have to give them something or collaborate with them to, to, on the work to make it happen. Some, there's got to be something, some sort of payment mm -hmm. in exchange for some kind of a good or a service. Right, right. Which is essentially capitalism. Yeah, I mean, that is the basics of capitalism. It's interesting you mentioned that nobody's going to give you anything for free because it's the other... Uh, the promise of socialism is yeah, that yeah. you're going to get your, whether it's a, um, what do they call that now, the uh, the wage, the living wage or whatever that everyone's supposed to get. Uh, universal income? Universal income, yeah. Universal basic income. Uh, whether it's that, that everyone just gets paid regardless of anything, uh, which if you understand inflation, that doesn't make any sense. Um, if you get things for free, then something's gone wrong somewhere. You're, you're either with someone you love very much and they love you very much and they're giving you things for free because they love you, like your parents, your wife, your family, whatever, or uh, you're being used somehow, you're being scammed somehow because things aren't free in life. Uh, and that's, it's it's one of those things that, yes, it's kind of hard to swallow, I guess, but once you understand that, then it changes your whole relationship with everything. Because then you understand, well, if I want something from someone, I need to give them something in return. And that's not a dirty thing. That is not a wrong thing. That's not a bad thing. The fact that you want something from someone and so you give them something in return. There's a uh, interesting guy who runs a, uh, it's called Black Swan Group, and he was an FBI negotiator. And he talks about that a lot to do with negotiations, where you need to go into the negotiation understanding that uh, you need to have something that you can give up or that you can uh, shift around and then it helps if they understand that as well because there's some people go to negotiation and, and they basically just want what they want and they don't want to move and if that happens and you're both going to come to a standstill and if neither one wants to move then the whole thing's just going to be moved it's not going to happen the deal uh, but if you both come in with something that you can give up or that you're capable or willing to give up if necessary uh, and you've already planned that out ahead of time, then it's a lot easier because when that moment comes and it's like, well, this just isn't enough for me. I need a little more. You could say, well, what if we gave you this as well? Or if you ask them for, well, what would you like along with that? Then you suggest something that you're like, sure, I don't care. We'll add that into the pile. I don't need it anyways. Uh, but if you have that willingness, if you have that attitude going into it, if you're not iron fisted about it, then those things work a lot better. But that's just of the basics of negotiation of any kind of deal, any kind of arrangement, any kind of capitalist you know, trade. But that works over into all aspects of life, is if you want something from someone, you get that nine times out of ten if you have something to give to them in return. The only other way to do it is by force. The only other way to do it is to make someone give you something that it, for free. And that is basically what socialism does. It is the state robbing people of their own private labor, their own private ownership of whatever they've done, the fruits of their labor, and then giving it to someone else because that person needs it. And even though you made it or you built it or whatever, that other person needs it more than you, therefore you can't keep it. And uh, again, it completely removes your desires out of the equation. You are only important in so long as you support the giant machine of the social of socialism. Yeah. Yeah, there just seem to be a lot of uh, a lot of younger people that I've I've heard mentioning things about socialism, and they just don't mm -hmm. seem to understand a lot of this, mm -hmm. or they don't truly understand what socialism is. Uh, but logically, if you just uh, if you break it down to its simplest, if you trade something with somebody, if you sell something, if if there's any exchange anywhere, that's going to create some kind of an inequality. Someone's going mm -hmm. to come out slightly on top or slightly yeah. ahead, yeah. slightly richer slightly more wealthy than the other person you are never going to achieve total equality no matter what you do yeah because yeah. people are different if you want to boil it down even further some people are born with a great physique some people are not mm -hmm. you can't change that mm -hmm. they're just given a gift mm -hmm. and those people you, you can't there's no way to reconcile that so there is there's no system that's going to reconcile that right right that's another great uh story by um oh, who's that by harrison bergeron Anyways, Harrison Bergeron, it's a great story, and it's a short story, but the world that he creates within the story is that um, there is a handicapper general because people are born with different abilities and gifts. And some people are smarter, some people are dumber, some people are taller, shorter, etc. And the handicapper general comes up with ways of equalizing everyone. So if you're tall and strong, then you have to carry around weights all the time, sandbags on your person that weigh you down and make you 
as close as physically possible, as weak as the next person. Or if you're very smart, then you have to wear an earpiece where a bell rings every five minutes, and so you can never actually remember the thoughts you were thinking about, and so you're kind of dumbed down to be on the level of everyone else. And it's kind of uh, farcical in a way, but at the same time, it's a very realistic uh, in concept of that is what a socialist, communist environment would require if you wanted true equality, true, truly everyone to have the same, exact same opportunity of both outcome as well as opportunity of uh, the, the things that were presented to them. It, it would need to, you would need to remove people's natural abilities, God-given abilities. You would need to remove people's natural advantages and disadvantages. And again, at that point, the state is playing God. The social, even if it's the socialist group, they're playing God. They're basically deciding, well, you were born this way, or you're given this, or you were handed this, or you didn't have this, but we think it should be otherwise, and therefore we're going to mandate it otherwise. And uh, it, it's a very sad idea, because you are never allowed to flourish, you're never allowed to be who you really are in that kind of a world. Uh, they in, the, in communism, under the Soviets, when you see images or footage of them, those, they always look very gray, very flat, uh, even the people themselves. There's this idea that everything is washed out, everything is, and that's how it felt, that's how it looked, because no one was supposed to be, to stick out other than the glory of the state. And so, again, you as a person do not matter under socialism. You as a person are just one of the ants, you know, pushing this giant rock. That's all it is, essentially. Well, and what we've been doing here, we've been giving a lot of different, uh, presenting facts and old uh, history, things of that nature, citing old examples. I know we haven't gone into all this a ton, but like I said, mm -hmm. I would take forever. Yeah. I would, because I, I would love, believe me, I would love to delve into Animal Farm in 1984 and you know, go into Lord of the Flies and a bunch of this other stuff that actually is relevant mm -hmm. and can show you a lot, like, like you can learn a lot from reading those things, mm -hmm. old authors. But one final thing I would like to say as, uh, as Christians, mm -hmm. as a Christian, uh, one argument against this, if you look in Second Thessalonians 3.10, Paul said to the Thessalonians in his letter, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Now that's, I, I'm sure you've heard that before. There have been many, many Christian mothers who have been saying that <laughs> for decades now to their children and yeah. getting them to wash dishes. <laughs> um, mankind is naturally sinful and lazy. No system can correct for that. But on top of that, if a man does not work, neither should he eat. Mm -hmm. This system covers that man. Mm -hmm. It makes it okay for him to drag his heels. Right, right. Because... Once again, it's there's either force to make him do his work, which is not really free will. It's slavery. Or, if not, this man is dragging his heels, and he's not working, and he still gets the handouts. Mm -hmm. The welfare, and all a lot of that is going towards, or some of that is going towards people who, I mean, I'm not saying any of us are deserving of it, but some of us are willing to work for food. Mm -hmm. And other people are not willing to work for food. Mm -hmm. People who are not willing to work for food should not have food. Yeah. I mean, that according to the Bible, right. that's not me right. saying that. That's, that's God saying that. Right, right. And that's part of the thing with, the, with people who are attracted to it is, is that's part of the attraction is that, well, like you said, it'll cover those. It'll basically make sure people, the, the have-nots... Onto the guise of compassion. Yeah, right. Have something, you know, that they didn't have before because the state provided it for them. But again, you're basically trying to play God by saying these people deserve something that they did not earn. And that's not the way the world is supposed to work. I mean, that's not the way God set things up. That's not the way naturally yeah. that things work. Uh, if, if you are an animal and you just hang out in your den all day, you're going to starve and die. Like, it's, it's just a basic thing of reality in life. But because people like the compassionate, quote-unquote, side of it, that idea of providing for the needy, and this idea that uh, it will somehow bring up all the poor and make them richer. Uh, I don't, I don't uh, want to paint everyone that ascribes to socialism as ignorant, but I think anyone who does believe socialism is a good idea 
is ignorant in certain things. They have not studied socialism, they have not studied history, and they have not studied their own lives and searched their own hearts, if you will, to see yeah. is this really the kind of life and the kind of world that I would be comfortable with. They're probably confused. Yeah, um, because all you're ever going to hear from people who espouse socialism is the good stuff, you know, that all the poor are going to be richer, that all the, every mouth's going to be fed, there's going to be a, you know, a car in every driveway, etc., basically because it just magically happens. And it, it's, it's, a dece it's a deceit. It's, a, uh, it's insidious in some ways because it convinces you that everything's going to be all right. In reality, it can't be. It's not going to be under that system. It's not going to work. And um, that's, that's part of the reason it's kind of saddening, but it's also a little troubling to hear that socialism has gotten such a kind of cult following in the past couple of years where there is very, uh, very loud voices and people who espouse socialism, whether they call it, uh, whether they, what is it, if they're, they're a democratic socialist or whatnot, there's lots of stripes to socialism. Oh, yeah. Um, but that basic idea of socialism is the, the foundational principle of it, is that the society... Um, it's a social ownership of everything, production, everything, versus an individual ownership. Right. I did, yeah, as you said, I did, the, when I was looking it up, it got confusing too, because I found Wikipedia alone had five different examples of different types of socialism. Mm. Democratic socialism, by the way, and social, uh, socialist democracy, something like that, they're different. Mm. Those are different. I'm like, why you just switch the terms? Mm. But anyways, I started looking that up. There was a, and the, the definitions of a lot of this has changed, yeah. have changed yeah. over time. I, I found a 2020, or a, an article written in 2020 by another lady that was uh, describing the different forms of government or the different ideas of how to run government and whatnot. And in her article, it said that there were eight different forms of socialism. <laughs> And uh, Wikipedia just listed five, and then it had a category called other. <laughs> it's just amazing yeah. how many it, you can just come up with your own flavor. It, it, it's like yeah. it's like what what operating system would it be like? Android or something? You have your own flavor. This the is Linux where just this is snow cone. This is yeah. whatever you know lollipop or what. There's just so many different kinds. Mm -hmm. Which one do you like? Right. But my biggest beef with socialism would come personally. I in the past have not always been the most upstanding citizen. I actually was very lazy at a certain point. I was trying to do, I, I was I was into drugs a little bit. I was, I was actually in a very bad way. But for about almost two, a period of two years, I was actually homeless. And during that time, I met quite a lot of people. I was down in Louisville, Kentucky. This was during the Obama era. And a lot of handouts were being had and given by people back and forth. And I'm talking people who, once again, if a man doth not work, neither shall he so if you are in that position of being uh, of being homeless or you're um, you're in a bad way somehow and you're not actively seeking to get out of that, then you kind of have to reap what you sow. Mm -hmm. You, uh, if if you're not actively trying to get out of that situation, then you have no one to blame but yourself. Really, mm -hmm. you might you may get a handout. You may be fortunate. Uh, you know, God may smile upon you and He may send someone to your way to bless you. And their their compassion still exists. And that's a great thing. I still got quite a, quite a bit of compassion, even though I was not deserving of it at the time. However, a lot of those people, I found so, so many, an overwhelming majority of the homeless people I found there were just looking for the next handout. Mm -hmm. Free. You could walk around and get three, four meals a day if you wanted in Louisville for free and go find a place that there, you don't have to sleep outside. You could go find a hostel or one of those kind of places, a uh, shelter that would take you in depending on what you did, you know, that you just had to follow their little guidelines, be there by a certain time of day, different things of that nature. But that's just the basics. Obama put out uh, Obama phones. I don't know if anyone remembers the Obama phones or the stimulus checks or the, I mean, there, was, there were a lot of wonderful ideas that happened in the Obama era. <laughs> Whilst he was droning over in the, incessantly overseas and killing lots of innocent people, there were things going on here that were just straight up handouts mm -hmm. and all these people were treating them as such mm -hmm. you know that just increased the laziness the homeless population got to be like a big group mm -hmm. we kind of knew each other and i found people that i knew and i started meeting and talking to some of these people some of these people had come from other states mm -hmm. from other major cities and they were comparing and contrasting almost like they had a vacation map of the united states and they were pointing out oh if you go up to portland it's really great they're really cool people there and they will give you this, this, and this. Oh, and, and, and marijuana is legal, it, is legal up there, and you can actually you know, get it and whatnot. There's all kinds of different things people were discussing. 
and what are the benefits and drawbacks of going to different cities and what can you get mm -hmm. from that city. Mm -hmm. These homeless people were not, they were not dumb. They weren't idiots. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were very, very smart. And I met some of them that, that seemed like perfectly good, normal people and just seemed to be following this lifestyle for no good reason. They were stuck mm -hmm. in this loop, mm -hmm. eternal loop. And then they would get hooked on drugs or something else would happen while they were there and it just dragged them down further. It spiraled. And none of that, none of that helped people to come out of it. Right. right. Socialism in that system, or in, in that situation, socialism would not have compelled them to work harder mm -hmm. and it would not have brought them out of it. Right. You would have just had a bigger problem on your hands. Right. Just a bunch of dead weight. Yep. Yep. For me personally, that really convinced me not just that socialism won't work necessarily, but that handouts don't work. Mm -hmm. Because you would have to have a lot of people with a good spirit. You'd have to work under the premise that people are naturally good right. and that they're naturally going to do the right thing. Right. But that would be dead wrong. Yeah. Because a, a ton of people do not do the right thing naturally. Well, that's that's like... Um, it's just man's sinful nature. I want to say Dad was the one who had explained to me at one point that if someone asks you for money on the street, it's much wiser to offer to buy them a meal or buy them some yes. groceries to take yes. them there to oh, I can tell you that their wallet or whatever and go ahead and buy them whatever it is they need if you're gonna if you want to give them something if you feel like hey I need to help this person out to buy them food buy them toilet paper whatever it is as opposed to here's 20 bucks because again many of them unfortunately are hooked on some kind of drug so that 20 bucks is just gonna further feed that spiral of, of destruction in their life and it also quickly gives you an idea of whether this person needs help or they're just begging. Because if their response is, oh man, you know, I, why can't you just give me the money? Like, you know, I didn't need whatever, you know, screw you, which I've gotten that response before. Then you know, well, this person obviously had something else they wanted to do with that money than feed themselves or buy gas or whatever it is they were, you know, begging for, quote unquote. But if they're like, yeah, I, mean, I could really use a meal and you take them over and they have a meal, sure, you just help them out. You know, you just gave them... I mean, but even better would be if you could say, hey, do you need do you need some work? I own a garage. Like, come, you know, I mean, honestly, you know, we'll be keeping an eye on you. There's a camera in the garage, but I need help building this thing or we need help fixing up this truck or whatever it is. That Those kind of opportunities, then, again, you turn away people who are just going to be looking for a handout just or looking for their drug money. And it's going to give them an opportunity to make something of themselves, to actually start working, to actually earn a living, you know. Um, and that's part of that. I mean, that's going into a whole other thing, but that's part of that, again, goes back to the, the deep-rooted issues with socialism as a concept is basically everyone should just get stuff and you shouldn't be allowed to keep stuff. And, uh, I mean, that's basically, basically the problem with it is, um, is that it goes against human nature and it goes against God's will. It goes against, uh, what, um, the, the laws of nature, you know, the way everything is set up. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess we've talked around it in most different angles now. <laughs> yeah, no, I keep thinking of different, well, more quote-unquote points, mm -hmm. but they're just leading back to things we'd already said. Mm -hmm. the, the competition in the marketplace, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. helps spur on, but right. the, once again, that, that right. comes back to nice stuff. Yeah. Uh, competition spurs that on. Yeah. It makes it to where people are competing and trying to do better and trying to do better than the next guy and trying to make something nicer or trying to sell it better. Right. And ultimately, that's how you get, yeah, you get nice stuff, mm -hmm. you get, uh, you acquire wealth and whatnot, the, the mm -hmm. things of that nature happen in a capitalist society. Mm -hmm. And everyone, that's the thing, that it's kind of even in that sense because everyone has that e equal opportunity, especially here right. in the United States, right. the, of free enterprise. You can go do something. If you're homeless, you can go start. I mean, I'm not saying you could start a complete business right away that day. You'd have to make some concessions and maybe, you know, you'd have to do things a little bit differently than normal. However, you could start a business. Yeah. You could start doing something. You could start selling, I mean, you know, as long as it's legal. You can sell something. You can find something to do. Or you yeah. can get a job and buy your business license and start selling, you know, fruit on the street corner if you want to. Right. Whatever you want to do, that's that's legal and it's it's within reason. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But that can only happen in a capitalist setup. Yeah. That that wouldn't happen in a socialist setup because they would prevent that. And uh, we haven't really gone into that because we talked a lot about the negatives of socialism. Uh, but we figured we'd kind of save that for another time to talk about the pros and cons of capitalism. Yes, uh, obviously it's not perfect either. That's the most direct op uh, opposing comparison is socialism to capitalism. Um, on the whole, I would say capitalism is much more favorable to people and freedom and all of those things that I that are good uh, versus socialism 
but that's not to say capitalism is not without its inherent dangers or flaws and et cetera, et cetera. We, we, we'll talk about that at some point probably, but this, this time around, we kind of wanted to get into that, uh, especially because it seems to be a very relevant topic today. Um, again, somewhat surprisingly, being as we look back on the 20th century and we can see all the examples of socialism and communism failing miserably and ruining million and killing millions of people because yes. of those thoughts. Many lives lost. Uh, but it's still around and it's still hung on and there's still people who think, yeah, no, that may not be so bad. You know, maybe if we did have a socialist in power, then things would be all right. And I guess we kind of wanted to... Uh, talk about it, but also kind of make a statement that we're totally against that. <laughs> um, that that, but explaining why that's such a bad idea. Because yeah. like, I think the other problem politically is that you get a shouting match between two sides most often, and neither one's really explaining their side. They're just well, the other side's evil, and therefore I hate them. And it, I think if you have any, if you have two brain cells to rub together. And you actually break this stuff down and think about it again. I don't. I don't believe that you can come to the conclusion that socialism is a universal good unless you're being willfully ignorant or you're being willfully stubborn that you just don't want yeah. to change your, your stance. Uh, it yeah. is. It is a. Or you're one of the people on top, or who would be receiving the power end of this scenario. Therefore, I don't mind if you know. Sure, I'll take on this responsibility for all of you little people and help redistribute the wealth because in the process you're going to be able to fill your own pockets. Uh, so it's it's not something that um, that really should exist, but it does. And um, you know we kind of wanted to talk around it, and we also want to hear from you guys though because obviously we've said a lot, we've talked a lot, but if you have any opinions, responses, if there's something we forgot or misquoted or misremembered or whatever. That's the kind of stuff we'd love for you guys to point out and yes. mention in the comments. Good, bad, ill, negative, happy. Yes. Uh, tell us what you're wearing. Whatever. Just send us a comment. Uh, and be, if you like the video or you want to see more of it, if you hate it but you want to see more of it because you like how angry we make you feel, then like and subscribe to this video, to our channel, because we make, we'll be making more of this kind of stuff, I think, and as well as a lot of our other content as well. Right. Yes. Please do let us know if you think we're wrong or something. <laughs> That's yeah. fine. Or if you think I've if I've totally messed something up or misquoted something, yeah, yeah. by all means, I'm not perfect either. Yeah. Because that's that's inherent in everybody. Mm -hmm. Nobody's perfect. Mm -hmm. So please let me know. Or if there's a point that you think that yeah we need to make. I think that's about it. Uh, if you want to see more of our stuff, like we said, follow this channel. We'll be pu putting this out as an audio version on our podcast. Uh, you can go to our website, morefight.net, and see everything we're doing there. You can also uh, check us out on here on YouTube and uh, check out our Subscribe Star page. Again, if you've got a few bucks that you want to toss us to because you like what we do, and uh, again, that exchange of, hey, I like what you've done or I like what you're giving me, so I'm going to help pay for it, that we'd love if you could be a part of that process. Uh, we're going to be expanding that stuff uh, as over the coming year. We were just talking about recently, I mean, it's only May, where uh, this will be our May update. And we've done so much and figured out so much and hashed through so much already. We're really excited for the next uh, couple months here as we're look at going through to the end of the year and the things we've got planned, the things we want to show you, yeah. as well as, you know, the years to come. So uh, keep on board with us and uh, we'll have lots more exciting stuff in the future. Absolutely. Thank you for tuning in.